So the bomb went off and it tore off my right arm and right leg instantly. They never found those pieces of me. My left leg was snapped to the bone and then my left wrist was blown out really bad. At that point, my medic Dan Bateson was on me and I told him, don't worry about it, save my guys uh, in my line of work. I didn't think I was gonna make it home. You are about to embark upon the great crusade to meet this mounting aggression. And make no mistake about it, good will prevail. I am from Vassar, Michigan, uh, born and raised in a small town right outside of Saginaw and Flint area. Um, basically like you see on Andy Griffith's show, a little town like Mayberry, and uh, just really great childhood. So the reason I joined the military was because I was in college playing college football. Um, I wasn't really there for school, I was there for the football program. And I realized that college wasn't my thing at the time, so I moved back home, tried college near home, didn't like that either, and thought, you know what, I'll come back when I can focus. And I started talking to re the recruiting branches, and I had it narrowed down to the Army and the Marines. And uh, the Army went out with the airborne paratroopers, and um, I joined in 2006, in March. Everybody thinks jumping out of planes is hard. It's not. It's gravity, you know? So the training for paratroopers is uh, just run a lot and then jump out of airplanes and let your parachute do the work. And then you have a second one if the first one doesn't work. But I had to use it one time. It's fine. My first deployment to Afghanistan was in 2007. We left in January, and it was a 15-month deployment. I was part of a headquarters battalion. Um, I was an infantry guy. This lieutenant colonel wanted three infantry guys for his personal security detachment. So he pulled us, and everybody's like, oh, you're infantry. I'm like, I have four more weeks of training. But uh, I went there to be his personal security. Best job ever. At 19, I was a private second class, and I was assigned for $6 million worth of equipment and became a truck commander. So I was in charge of if we shoot at somebody or if we don't uh, by the age of 20. And, um, you know, it was, it was a good time. It was a really, really good way to come up in the military. And I think it really helped my leadership style because I wasn't the guy that yelled at anybody. I was treated like an adult and uh, the hazing wasn't there and things like that. So I was different with uh, my second and third deployment in my leadership positions because uh, I was just always happy and smiling and had a good time. So my second deployment, uh, we went back overseas and I was with 473, uh, which is a cab unit. Um, I was the infantry guy and we were part of the um, coin platoons, they called them. So there was two infantry squads and two cavalry squads and we worked together and you know in harmony of course but we were a little more um, active we had about six months out of the the year-long deployment that were really hectic and crazy which um, you know as a team leader over there and then a squad leader over there um, it was it was a lot of fun a lot of chaos and we jumped around from uh, Herat to Bala Mergab and there's actually a Marine Marsoc unit that wrote a book about Bala Mergab and what was going on up there and we went in there to help clean it up and uh, I mean it was just a wild deployment. On that deployment I actually re-enlisted. My wife and I really understood the military lifestyle and we bought a house while I was on my way back home and when I got back we found out we were going to have a baby. Um, and it was really exciting like you know my life was going really well. I got promoted to E6, bought a house, had a daughter and um, just no, no complaints. So third deployment, we went over, um, and this deployment was going to be a nine-month deployment. I had orders to take me to Fort Hood, Texas, actually, after my year of stabilization was up. And the big army said, you know what, Sergeant Mills, you don't have to go. Like, you got over two years of combat experience. We need to build this new brigade up, and we need, you know, combat-tested and proven non-commissioned officers. And I thought, that's not fair to my, my guys that serve underneath me. I worked myself up to be the weapon squad leader. So at 24 years old, I was the third highest ranking non-commissioned officer out of about 40 guys. And my men respected me. There was the brotherhood and the calling. My wife understood it, and we just had a newborn, so it really made sense to go back overseas. Um, not to be away from my family, but you know, the, the overseas pay is better than the, the stateside pay. And I just, I just didn't think that my, my guy should go without me. So I had my sergeant major cancel my orders. I mean, I, I asked him nicely, obviously. And had him cancel my orders, I went overseas, and uh, first day on the ground, we were right in it. I mean, it, it started up, we, uh, we kind of, I guess, shook a hornet's nest. Uh, the other unit that we replaced, you know, they told us, you know, don't go here, don't go there, da 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 da. And of course, we had to go poke the bear. So we went here, we went there, we went everywhere. And first day was a massive firefight. And um, we were trying to cross this dry riverbed, and all these rounds started skipping off at the guys in the dry riverbed. And I'm the weapon squad leader, so I have the 240 Bravos and my team set up. 
and all hell breaks out. So we start ripping rounds, and um, everybody takes a knee or takes a prone position, and that's the first time my guys saw me in action. Uh, my first sergeant knew who I was from my deployments, knew how I acted, but if I wasn't in a firefight, I was always happy, smiling, joking around, not your typical you know, guy you see in the movies, like grumpy and gruff and whatever. And uh, our first firefighter we got into, a guy went down, we thought he got shot, he just, he tore his knee up pretty bad, mis meniscus and ACL and MCL and stuff. And my first arm was like, third squad, go get him. And I said, no, I'm, I got this. So I threw my, my M4 and I ran down about football field and a half a length down to the wadi. I put him on my back and I ran him out, um, set him down behind a building and I got my M4 back and I was the last one on the objective with uh, the Ford Observer. We popped smoke for the Kiowas to come in and then we, you know, went back to our, our Ford operating base. And that was the day that everybody found out there's a different side to me than, than what they see, you know. Um, and uh, I had two guys that were team leaders in a 508, which is infantry um, uh, battalion that were new to our unit, that were like, hey, Sergeant Mills, we didn't know how you got your staff sergeant rank. We didn't know why you're weapon squad leader, which is, you know, the senior slot. Because, you know, I was younger than the other E6s, I had less time in grade. And I, they said, well, after today, like, we'll, we'll follow you to hell and back. And I, I was like, well, I appreciate that, guys. And then every time we got in firefights, uh, from there on out, um, I would go to the front and start singing, like, 80-second songs. Because I knew it annoyed them, but they couldn't, out, they didn't outrank me, you know. So, and then it became this fun thing we always did whenever we got in a really big firefight. We'd high-five each other and things like that. And um, we were, you know, five out of seven days a week probably in it. And then on my, uh, like a month and a half into my deployment, we had a phone call from a village elder come in that he needed some help in the village, pretty typical. And on April 10th of 2012, uh, we went on a patrol. And we always had a minesweeper guy out front sweeping the ground, um, checking it. And we did that not once but twice to make sure everything was secure and safe and marked it clear. And um, it was for all intents and pur you know, purposes for what we were looking for. And I took my backpack off and a 120 pound backpack hit the ground and underneath it was an IED. So the bomb went off and it tore off my right arm and right leg instantly. They never found those pieces of me. Uh, unfortunately, they just, you know, uh, vaporized. And I got thrown on the left side of my face and when I rolled over my back and I saw the aftermath of what happened, my right side's gone. My left leg was snapped to the bone. I had muscle and tendon holding it kind of on. But if you imagine your left ankle bone touching your left thigh, mine was doing that. And then my left wrist was blown out really bad. And at that point, my medic, Dan Bateson, was on me, and I told him, don't worry about it, save my guys uh, in my line of work. I didn't think I was going to make it home, uh, not because I was suicidal, but just the guys that I had to say goodbye to. I thought I had less injuries than I had, so I said, don't waste your time and go save my guys. It'll be over quick, and, you know, it, it is what it is. He ignored that, and him and my platoon sergeant, Sergeant Hambright, um, who's now a sergeant major, uh, put tourniquets on all four of my limbs. You know, so within 30 to 40 seconds, they had tourniquets on all my limbs. Um, while they were working on me, two things were happening. One, I was telling myself not to freak out. I kept seeing the movie Saving Private Ryan in my head, as weird as that sounds to everybody, because in the movie, the medic gets shot in the stomach. He cries out for his mom. He begs not to die, and he ultimately dies. And I always told myself, no matter what happens, like, I'll never, I'll never be that guy. You know, I was always first in a firefight, last out, and never showed fear. Uh, I exuded confidence, um, and at that point, I wasn't going to show any show anything like that to my guys because my last, um, you know, breaths on the earth that I thought I was going to take was not going to be, you know, having them have a memory of me crying out and, and begging to live. So I told myself, like, just stay calm. Matter of fact, I reached out to my my microphone, my left hand, because it still worked. It's blown out the wrist really bad, but I still had my thumb, index, and middle finger. And I reached up and I hit the microphone and called my lieutenant and said, "Hey, six, this is four. I got guys injured, you know, I need your medic with mine. And he sent Doc Voice over. So Doc Voice worked on the other two guys that were injured. And then he came and worked on me. Uh, they put a stern IV in me. It's the only pain I actually felt that day. And then they put me on a helicopter. And on the helicopter, uh, there was me and two guys, Ryan and Brandon. And um, one guy was yelling out, he had a lot of pain. And he, and well deserved, right? It was, he, I'm sure he was in a lot of pain. I know he was. And I yelled at the flight medic, hey. I said, hey. I said, take your helmet off. And he couldn't hear me because he had his big space suit helmet on. And I said, hey, and I might say some choice words, you know. Um, I said, take your helmet off. Again, might have been more colorful than that. 
and I got my arm out of the strap that they tied it down to and broken and dangling. I said, I went like this and I made the motion. And he took the helmet off and I said, hey, give my guys water and tell them they're gonna be okay. And they put this protective goop in my eye from the rotor wash, they wanna scratch up your eyeballs and stuff. And it looked like I was looking through beer goggles. But I picked my head up enough where I could see them. I gave them a wink and I said, you guys are gonna be fine. We're gonna be okay. And um, the flight medics actually, the, they, they took care of them, right? They were taking care of them. I knew they were taking care of them, but the guy calling out in pain, I wanted them to calm him down. And, um, you know, I gave him the wink, you know, whatever, and reassured him. And then uh, the flight medics actually sent my wife a really nice letter about that they couldn't believe, you know, that in my situation that I was doing that. And I look at it as I had nothing else to do. So, you know, made it to the hospital. They rolled me into surgery, and I'm still awake at this time, and I keep trying to sit up. But the third time I sat, I tried to sit up, and the third time that nurse pushed me down, I looked at her and said, hey, quit touching me, I'm fine, like, leave me alone. I gotta get back to my guys. And she's like, Sergeant Mills, I don't know how you're still awake right now, but you need to go to sleep. And then I looked at her, I was like, my little girl, am I ever gonna see her again? Because my daughter was six months old, right? So my daughter, Chloe, um, was only six months old, and I didn't know if I was waking up again. That, at that point, I was not gonna be in charge of, you know, my consciousness. So she knocked me out, I asked about my daughter, and I went out. And then uh, what I was told is nine doctors and seven nurses worked on me for 14 hours. Um, two nurses, basically for nine hours, pumped air in and out of my lungs to keep me alive, uh, like you see on TV. And then they ran out of blood that day in the blood bank with A-positive universal blood. So they had people doing buddy blood. If you had A-positive blood, you go to the front of the hospital and you donate your blood. If you have universal, nurses were giving me blood. And, you know, um, I got to meet these doctors and nurses later on, a couple of them, and tell them thanks for believing my life mattered. You know, they loosened up one tourniquet, I bleed out in two minutes or less, but instead 14 hours of operations thinking that, you know, that I mattered. So, you know, I, we get through the surgery. Um, I come out stable but critical. They keep me medically sedated. I'm a triple amputee. Right, my right arm, both legs are gone, and then they go ahead and take me to um, can or from Kandahar on the tenth. They take me on the twelfth to Bagram, they take me in for a washout, and they realize my left hand had necrotized, the skin died, so they had to cut my left hand off, and I became a quadruple amputee. And then two days after that, they flew me to Launchville, Germany, and they woke me up from my medical station on April fourteenth, which is uh, my twenty-fifth birthday, actually in real life. And I wake up, and the only person in the room was my brother-in-law, because before anybody deploys now, they fill out paperwork. And uh, the paperwork is in the Army called the Blue Book. And it's the most morbid thing you'll do. And it's, you plan your funeral. And you know, it's like, where you're going to be buried, what kind of service, what music, what's in your coffin with you. But the last question is, who escorts your body home, if anybody? So mine was always going to be Josh. And Josh had me put down if anything happened to him. And he was the only one in the room when I came to. And when I woke up, you know, uh, I asked him, the first thing was, my soldiers, how are my soldiers? And he told me, you know, Ryan's here, Brandon's there, they're going to be okay. You took most of the blast. I said, okay. And then I asked him, am I, am I paralyzed? And he said, no. And I said, Josh, I, I can't put my fingers and toes. That you can tell me the truth, am I paralyzed? And he said, you're not paralyzed, but you don't have them anymore. And the only thing I said was, oh. And then for three hours, I literally ignored everybody, doctors, nurses. Um, him. They had questions, but I had my own questions, right? We all would in that situation. Like, I was asking, am I a bad person? Does God hate me? What did I do wrong in life to deserve this? How can I still be a husband and a father? And, you, not, like, I, like I said, not suicidal, but just, I was like, why didn't I just die? Like, how is this going to be better? And for three hours, those swirled in my head, you know? And then finally, Josh chimed in. I, got that, I had to call my wife and my parents, and I said, yeah, I guess you're right. Uh, so I called my, my wife first, and when she answered, I said, hey, what's up? I'm fine. Like, love you, bye. I didn't want to have a conversation about it. And then I called my parents, and I, about the same conversation, my mom did yell happy birthday through the phone, and then my mom and dad hung up, and, you know, three days after that, I made it back home to uh, Walter Reed in Bethesda, and saw my wife for the very first time, and the uh, reunion isn't exactly what people thought it was going to be. Like, I came rolling in, they said, Mrs. Mills, your husband's right leg is ripped open, a suture split. We have to cut two inches off his right leg, but we need you to sign the paperwork. Now you are in charge of medical care, and if you don't, he'll bleed out. So here's my 23-year-old wife with a six-month-old on her hip getting told, sign this so we can 
you know, take more of your husband's leg off, and all she wants to do is talk to me. And I'm talking to her like, hey, it's fine, just sign the paperwork. It's, it, you're good, just sign the paperwork. We're okay. And then the 18th, you know, after my surgery, the next day she came in the 18th, and I talked to her, and I was like, hey, I appreciate you being here, but you, you should take the house and the cars and the money I've thought about it. Like, anything saved up we have is, is yours, but you should go. Like, take everything and go. You know, this is not life I would choose for you. Um, and I, here I am, I'm a, you know, I feel like I'm going to be a burden. i got to be fed now. i got to be dressed, you know, and help with everything. Imagine being a 25-year-old baby, basically. You know, I told her, I, I don't want this for you. Like, it's okay. And she, a little bit offended, and she's like, that's not, we'll get through this together, you know. So, you know, my success story that I have uh, directly relates to my support system with my my wife and my daughter, you know, and, and uh, my family. And um, when I'm sitting in a hospital bed, 110 pounds lighter, right, with no arms, no legs, wondering why didn't I just die, realizing I didn't die, and that I'm not going to die, um, I had nothing to do but get better. And then my daughter, right, my daughter is everything. Um, the reason for my success is easily summed up to her, you know. Uh, I'm still her dad at the end of the day. I'm still you know, going to be there for her. Um, she'll see me struggle for sure, but there's nothing I won't do for her. And I have a son now too. He's four, right? I mean, he's after the injury, but he's four now. So when I'm in the hospital bed telling my wife she should leave me, she says no. And I'm sitting there wondering what life's going to be like. And then I see people in the same situation that come see me in my room with no arms, no legs. You know, Todd nicely came to visit me. He's the second ever quadruple MT. I'm the fourth to survive my injuries from the wars of Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, you just sit there and you realize, like, I have no other option, you know. Um, I don't mean to sum it up so simply why I, I was able to recover, but that's as easy as it is to me, you know. I had nothing to do but sit there and either accept people feeding me or get an arm, you know, accept rolling around in a wheelchair, being pushed around, you know, or getting legs back on. You know, having my, my daughter have to watch me ask for help or just doing it myself. You know, I drive my daughter gymnastics and practice Mondays and Wednesdays. I take her to soccer and basketball. I take my son to school. You know, I, I do those things. I'm there with them. And, yeah, I'm a little different. Don't get me wrong. Like, I understand that I stand out. But in my community, I've made myself very well known. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm jumping ahead here, but I'm an entrepreneur. I own numerous businesses, fortunately, just a lot of debt. But uh, I own some businesses. I have my nonprofit that's very successful, I would say. Very thankful for that because the people that believe in us. And I don't let people see me as anything different. Um, when you first meet me, yeah, I have no arms and legs. I get it. But after you, we hang out, you see as, you know, I'm pretty capable for the most part. Uh, and my buddy, he asked me to throw the first pitch out at the team I sponsored for Little League this year. <laughs> and my wife was on the text chain. She goes, Dane. How is he going to throw a ball? Like, he can't throw. <laughs> he goes, I just forget. I just forget that he doesn't have, you know. And that's what I go for. Instead of being the guy with no arms, no legs, um, I like being like, oh, the guy that owns, you know, the White Duck Brew Pub restaurant or the guy that has that Travis Mills Foundation um, and things like that. And that's what I go for. So change the narrative. But I guess to get back to my recovery process, I didn't, I didn't have a choice. I actually only had 10 surgeries that were, like, the major ones with washouts. Uh, I was with an arm within five weeks of my injury. So a month and a week, I had my arm. And just shy of two months, I was up and walking again on short legs. So my recovery process was faster because I had no internal injuries. My wounds healed up really well. And what you see is what you got. And, um, you know, it was just luck of the draw with that kind of stuff. So I was, I was walking again just shy of two months. So my wife was huge in my recovery. Kelsey stuck by my side. Um, yeah, I need help. Like, I got five minutes of my day I absolutely I hate, right? I got my legs on, which I need help doing. I got to help put my pants on, the, the button I can't really do that well, you know, and put my arm on the right way. But once I get them on, I'm, I'm pretty independent, you know, pretty good. And um, I just, I just got to make sure that it's the relationship of husband and wife, not patient caretaker, even though I do need help with things. And that's always been my focus, you know. Um, this happened to both of us for sure, and as bad as I, you know, can feel about this is the life she has to live and my kids have to live, they take it in stride. You know, I give them every opportunity and every chance I can to have a better life, and uh, I work all the time, and uh, 
just do anything I can to, to, to make their life better. You know, it's not lost on me that people stepped up to help out either Kelsey or me or both of us. The Travis Mills Foundation was an idea my wife and I had to give back. Uh, we were given so much love and support at Walter Reed that we thought we should do something. And we founded it because I remember the care packages I got overseas from my wife and my parents and my in-laws and my friends because I told them, hey, look, I want pepper jerky, right? I want Orbit gum because it holds the flavor the longest. Stride does not do that. I don't care who Stride is watching. But anyways, uh, I wanted a five-pound bag of gummy bears because I love gummy bears. And, uh, you know, just things that you, you want. Like Hillshire Farms has their, like, their Christmas kits where you get, like, the salami and the cheese and the... Uh, the um, crackers and the, the spicy mustard and uh, you know I wanted that and I thought some of the care packages you got were like socks and baby powder it's like that's all good but you know get the good stuff so what I did was I talked with Kelsey and we decided to do care packages at first so we donated five thousand dollars from ourselves and we sent care packages to my guys and their new units they were with right so we sent out hundreds of care packages what well, with all the good stuff you know what I mean and um, then I, at the hospital, I was still at the hospital, and we started doing all these cool trips, and I got you know, better and better, and I would learn how to go whitewater rafting and kayaking, downhill mountain biking, uh, snowboarding, monoskiing, and all this cool stuff. But because of my injuries, I was injured to the point where I needed what's considered a non-medical assistant. So Kelsey got to go on these trips with me, and the, the funding was for the service member. And then if a service member was injured, like I, I am, or that needed assistance, putting on prosthetics, making sure, you know, help with all that stuff. Then they got to bring a non-medical assistant with them. So my wife got to come enjoy these trips with me and like see the adrenaline rush and me realizing, hey, look, I won't teach my son how to throw a spiral and like catch out in the yard. I know that. I've accepted it. But I will be able to still go and do kayaking and fun outdoor activities with them. And it was such an adrenaline rush to go down Mount Crestview on a mountain bike, right, 9,000 foot mountain and just have that freedom that I was like, this is amazing. And then we got thinking, well, we're moving to Maine, where she's originally from, and we should, we should you know, bring some families out. And it started really modestly. Just, you know, rented a camp from a guy, wasn't really adapted that well, brought some families out. And it went really well the first year, so we did it again the next year for a week, and then we thought, we got some traction, so we bought a facility. It was in really bad disrepair. Elizabeth Arden, she was a cosmetic pioneer. She built a house in 1929 up in Maine. We did about two, uh, two and a half years of renovations, which are like two and a half, three million dollar renovations. And we had no funding really except for when I go and speak at companies and then they would you know, pay me to be a speaker but then also give back and believe in my mission. And we did it from the grassroots, right? And um, we opened officially in 2017 the Travis Mills Foundation Veterans Retreat Center. We bring out combat um, and service-connected disabled veterans with physical injuries and their families. So eight families per week with paralyzation, amputation, spinal cord injuries, something physical that happened to them. And we show them how to do things adaptively, right? There's fishing and hiking and kayaking and oh, archery, ice fishing, and dog sled uh, ra you know, rides. And we do it because the family's all going through it, not just a service member, but we let them know these other you know, seven families, so there's eight families that come total every week and say, hey, look, you're not alone. Do not live life on the sidelines. Always be active in society and active in your family and understand you can still do things adaptively. And um, you know, we started out with one staff member, then two, and now we're up to like 20 some. And I don't take a dime. We've raised quite a bit of money and we're one of the top VSOs for what we do. And we also partner with Warrior Path Program, which is on the Boulder Crest Foundation in Virginia. And it's a post-traumatic stress program for first responders and combat veterans. And you know, it's one of the, the best in the nation. It's non-clinical, train the trainer style. And anybody that's suffering should come our way because it's, it's free for them. So, you know, to date we've helped over um, 800 families that were able to come, um, over like 100 or 200 post-traumatic stress veterans that came. We started this program about two years ago. And we're just so lucky and grateful to be able to work that we do. And um, as the founder and president, I don't take a dime. I never will pay myself. And we're going to keep growing and doing great things because people out there believe in us. It's funny, I get asked all the time, you know, if I could do it all over again, would I, would I still do the same route and do the same thing? And I say 100% no. I would not get blown up ever again. No matter how much good in the world I'm doing, how many lives have changed, how many people write in and tell me that, what my story meant to them, I would not get blown up. But luckily for me, uh, I've learned early on in my injuries I can't change the past. So I don't dwell on it. I just reminisce what I had. It's one of my life lessons I live by. 
And I think it's important everybody knows, like, as much as I would change getting blown up, I would not change the military. Uh, I loved it. Um, I think it's a great opportunity for people to, you know, find themselves. Um, you know, I was an all-star athlete in high school. I went to college, played football. I had the choice to play baseball at the college, but I wasn't into school. I was just wasting time and money. And uh, I got to grow up really, you know, I grew up in Michigan, but when I got to be 18 in basic training and everything, I really grew up in Fort Bragg. And um, I have very fond memories of the military. I, I don't look at my injuries as the Army's fault. I don't look at it as something that I wish I'd go back and, or that, that I, I'm so mad about getting injured that I hate the Army because the truth is the Army's got great opportunities. Every branch has great opportunities. I wanted to be infantry. You know, that's one of the things I, I uh, pride myself on is not getting lost in like the, uh, well, what if I didn't do this or what if I could change that because it'll drive you nuts. And then the next thing I tell people is you can't always control your situation, but you can always control your attitude. And my situation literally never changes. I wake up with no arms, no legs every morning now. And if I'm at my house in Maine, I jump from my bed to my wheelchair. I get my arm off the charger. I get my coffee. I get my wife's coffee set up. You know, she comes out, the kids come down, and we just go about our day. And my attitude is always positive because I was given the chance. And people wonder how I stay so positive. Well, I have friends I had to say goodbye to that left behind parents and spouses and children. And um, I truly think it'd be selfish if I was ever angry and quit because I gave uh, my arms and legs, which didn't want to, it sucked, it happened, but I did not give everything. And I'm here watching my children grow. I'm here a part of life every day. And um, you know, for their sacrifice and so many others that I don't know, um, I'm gonna make the best of it. And I think that's, you know, that's, that's what I miss the most, um, the brotherhood, but I don't know, I just, uh, when I need to be carried out, um, not one person shied away. They just right there for me. And uh, so, yeah, I think I'm proud of that. I'm proud of my service. Uh, I'm proud to serve my country and thankful for the opportunity, you know, as weird as it, is, as it sounds, you know, with the arms and legs now. But uh, yeah, I guess I just loved every minute of it. So it's kind of weird, right? Kind of weird.